uh, we often find that these events are particularly useful to doctoral students and um, people early in their career. And so it'll hopefully be helpful. Uh, the journal of management studies is um, a very established journal in the field. It's sort of based in the UK and associated with a uh, educational body, called, a scholarly body called SAMS, Society for the Advancement of Management Studies. But it's actually a very international uh, journal, and it has been increasingly so over the past few years. So this opening slide is only to say that um, the general editors, Jonathan Doak, Carolyn Gatterell, and Daniel Muzio, uh, who are based, uh, Jonathan is American based in the US, Carolyn is British based in the UK, and Daniel is Italian based in, in the UK. And they're supported by a team which is also fairly international. I'm not going to go through all the names. Uh, you will get to meet one of the, the people from this team in the second half, those of you who are participating in the, in the breakout rooms. But the main point I would make is actually between the, the team, we cover a large number of areas uh, and also are based in different parts of the world. I myself uh, have an interest in international business and entrepreneurship. And actually a lot of papers from emerging markets tend to come to me. Uh, there's also Weile uh, Shi or Stone Shi uh, who also gets these kinds of papers. And in general, I would say JMS is hospitable to papers from emerging markets, but uh, it's still important uh, to be thinking about uh, making a contribution. And, and I'll come to that in just a moment. Uh, in this slide, the, the main point to say is that, is sort of to reiterate what I just said, an inclusive ethos. And that includes, um, not only being open to papers with an emerging markets focus, but also a wide range of methodological approaches and philosophical underpinnings. And this reflects the European uh, origins of the journal. Uh, and I'll show you a slide in a, in a little bit to show you the, the breakdown of methods and so on. But if you happen to be a qualitative researcher, you can be quite, uh, it's, it's not like the majority of papers are qualitative, but you know, uh, we're quite open to, to that, as well as different types of uh, underlying uh, theories and uh, philosophical lenses. I think JMS is known to uh, be a pretty broad church in that regard. Editors have a fixed term. We cannot publish in JMS other than editorials introductions. And as we get towards the end of um, the, review process for papers that are lucky enough to survive, uh, we involve one other member of the team just to sort of uh, get a second opinion before uh, wrapping up the, the process, which hopefully results in an acceptance letter. And we've, uh, in the past year or so, moved over to Scholar One. But what is, I think, very useful about JMS is there is a dedicated team that Joe who uh, kicked us off is part of, uh, and they are extremely responsive. And in fact, till, I don't know, a year ago or so, actually everything was done by email and uh, JMS prided itself in the quality of its service. So now you have the advantage of the automation that Scholar One brings, but I think also this additional element that's still there, you know? Um, so that's, that's actually one of the nice things about JMS. Uh, in terms of uh, the, the statistics that generally get talked about, I, I'm not very big on this, I, I must confess. Uh, we have an impact factor of 5.388. I don't think though I've ever decided what journal I would send to because of the, the impact factor. I think it's just an indication that this is a high quality journal. Uh, it's ranked in the 30s in the ISI rankings, perhaps from a, Asian perspective, most important thing is that it's been on the FT list now for over a decade. Uh, and I just I noticed that a lot of business schools in uh, Asia pay a lot of attention to the FT list. And I also remember when it got added in 2010 that a lot of people in Europe were very, very pleased about that uh, because it's a very hospitable journal to 
uh, methods and uh, uh, philosophical approaches that uh, many European scholars use. In Asia, my observation is that the, it's a, the, the US influence is, is very large. Most of my colleagues in China will write quantitative papers. A lot of the papers I get from India are, are also quantitative and JMS is very open to that too. Uh, it, the important point here is that it is highly regarded. So, you know, there, there is kudos to be had for publishing in JMS. It's uh, ABS category four uh, it, in the Australian list, A star. So it is worth your while to publish in JMS. We have a range of articles. Uh, the not so common ones are the ones listed below the regular articles, which is we have a short essay a collection, we have point counterpoints, and we have review articles. So, you know, with, with these sort of things, it tends to be more, uh, you know, somebody reaches out to the journal and, and makes a proposal about this. But I'll be mainly focusing on making regular submissions to the journal. And as you can see, the vast majority of our submissions are original articles. But if anybody has ideas for any of those um, uh, other non-standard uh, types of journals, then reach out to the JMS office if you want to get more information. Again, this is just showing that, again, the vast majority of our submissions are regular submissions, also showing that the number of submissions has been rising. A decade ago, we had 800 submissions. And I, I remember when um, I was a doctoral student and attended my first JMS event on the sidelines of AOM in 2004. If I remember correctly, Mike Wright was getting very excited that they had gone above 300 or 400. So, you know, there's just been the steady increase and now uh, it's consistently upwards of 1,000, in fact, uh, in the last couple of years, over 1,200, which, and that explains partly why the team, uh, editorial team has been getting bigger and bigger. So for this particular audience, you'll be happy to see that uh, about a third of the submissions come from Asia. Uh, and uh, so, you know, it's clearly um, on your radar and uh, do continue to, to keep JMS in mind. And I hope that today's event, especially for those of you who have your ideas discussed, will just help you, so nudge you along a little bit further down the road to increase your odds of getting in. Because actually, um, in fact, I'll just jump. Oh, uh, okay. So um, this shows the, uh, uh, the, the odds of um, going through the process. And as, as you can see, uh, after the first round of, uh, review the odds of, of rejection are actually high. About two thirds of the papers that get, uh, that go out for review uh, get rejected. But actually uh, about two thirds of the papers that come in get desk rejected. So, uh, you know, journals compete for the time of reviewers and at JMS we do try to get high quality reviewers. So we also as editors have to only send out papers that we think have a reasonable chance of success. One of the most miserable things about being involved on in the editorial side of things is writing uh, rejections. And I write rejections far more than I write uh, RNRs. Uh, and I'm still waiting to uh, write my first acceptance letter at JMS, having been in this role for uh, over a year and a half. So that's, of course, as you all know, the nature of the process. It's very time consuming. And the default outcome is rejection, unfortunately. So, you know, one needs to do one's best to increase the odds of uh, getting through the review process. Because once you go past the first round, if you get an R&R, &R, actually the odds of going through all the way uh, increase dramatically, as many of you know. So one of the things about uh, JMS is that it's particularly interested in unusual, surprising, edgy types of submissions. You are unlikely to see the word edgy in the 
PowerPoint deck of some of the other leading journals, because otherwise a lot of what I'm about to say will apply for any top journal. But I think what JMS tries to, uh, how JMS tries to distinguish itself in part is by saying, we welcome and we're hospitable to uh, scholars who are trying to challenge uh, dogmas and uh, push the envelopes as opposed to being, you know, there's a conservative way of trying to make a, a contribution and some JMS papers probably fit that category, but we are probably more open than most to uh, articles that really want to question the uh, status quo, challenge the status quo in a field. One of the things that's important is a strong value add in terms of theory, what's the contribution? And if there's one takeaway from today, it'll be, please think about your contribution from the start. And I think that's also going to be the focus in those breakout rooms. Uh, and then, you know, these are the things like, you know, we want to advance wisdom. Yes, we all want uh, to do that hopefully comes with the, uh, with making a contribution. But the point is that Again, we don't want you to want to do this in a mechanical way. We, we do want to push the, the field forward so that it has an impact, not, not just in a narrow theoretical sense, but also for, for practice. And trustworthy mechanics meanings, the met, meaning that the methods need to be solid. And on that front, I have to say, things have improved uh, a lot. And in the past uh, 18 to 20 months, the papers I've looked at don't often get um, sometimes they do get uh, criticized for the methods, but more often than not, it's for contribution and even contributions yeah, from around the world. I think we seem to be having some consensus on, on, on methods. At least that's what I'm seeing. Common reasons for rejection. Uh, and this is, is reasonably uh, similar, I think, across journals. Unclear, insignificant, uninteresting contributions lack of rigor, as I mentioned, but in my experience, that's been less of an issue uh, because I think people seem to have great training these days. Weak implications for management theory and practice, papers that remain at the gap spotting level, excellent mechanics, but boring, uninsightful. I want to focus on the third bullet point because especially papers from emerging markets, just be aware that it is insufficient to identify the lack of research in an emerging market context as a gap. Also, a little bit different from a journal like say Management and Organization Review that I was involved in before I joined uh, the JMS uh, team. Uh, emerging markets is not of inherent interest. And so the argument has to be that we know Little, that there is a that there is a strong rash uh, there needs to be a strong rationale for using the emerging market context to make a contribution to wider management studies. Um, and so again, just to reiterate some of the, the the issues, three things worth bearing in mind. The first is clear motivation. And in some, in a sense, I think this is what you, those of you who will be involved in the second half of the workshop will get to test. You know, it, even in a five minute conversation where you're just discussing your idea, is it clear what the motivation is? Because often criticisms about a lack of contribution are basically a mirror image of a, a lack of clear motivation for the paper in the, in the front end, in the introduction. Okay, so what is the paper about and why should we, we care? Why is it interesting and novel? Uh, and then what's the clear research question? Therefore, what is the, the contribution and the core message? And of course, part of the challenge is that contribution is like beauty. It's in the eye of the beholder. You know, I'm, I'm very confident the people who get criticized, and this happens a lot with my own papers, for a lack of clear contribution, you know, aren't idiots. People have thought about it and think they are making a contribution, but it's not evident uh, uh, to the reviewers. 
the burden, of course, of making the case though is on the author. And that's why these types of events, presenting papers and conferences, so on, is extremely important. I think this is, is very clear. The other reason, of course, and this takes me to the second point, is the lack of clear writing or clarity around concepts. Again, sometimes the issue is we as authors are so clear about what we want to say, but when it comes out on paper, it's not so, so clear. So obviously defining concepts clearly, not including too many concepts and embedding concepts in the relevant literature is, is important. This is where I think actually having senior co-authors makes a huge difference. I have found having senior co-authors very helpful in two regards. One is clarifying uh, the, co the concepts and, and the writing, especially when it's a paper that I'm driving and I'm very, very uh, passionate about, but you know, sometimes I'm trying to achieve too much, say too much, uh, even though I think I write reasonably well. When a second author, a, a more seasoned co-author and someone who's a little bit detached looks at the paper and says, nah, this is too dense. You know, we're over-egging the pudding. Let's simplify this a bit. That's very helpful. Uh, and the other area where I find a senior co-author makes a big difference is in the R&R &R process. If you're lucky enough to get a revision, uh, then a lot of it's about judgment calls. And that's where having somebody senior helps. And then of course, rigorous methods, um, you know, uh, that that that's of course extremely important. Just to reiterate what I said, AMS welcomes submissions on emerging market themes, but there needs to be a substantive contribution to wider management studies. One thing I've sort of guessed from some of the submissions that I've been receiving is that these are papers that were rejected at JIBS, at the Journal of International Business Studies, uh, and then come directly to Journal of Management Studies, perhaps because it is an FT journal, as opposed to going to, say, Journal of World Business or Management International Review, International Business Review, other journals in the IB stable. And the problem is that then the authors haven't bothered to say something more broadly beyond how they contribute to IB theory. So papers on emerging market multinationals, for example, are welcome, but it's important to be able to say something that advances, say, institutional theory as well, as opposed to a slightly narrower focus on the emerging market multinational phenomenon, which an IB journal might uh, think suffices, although even IB journals say we need a theoretical contribution. I think a big difference is IB journals want to see a contribution to IB theory, but JMS would expect a broader contribution. So, for example, I had a paper published in Journal of Management Studies on international new ventures uh, using, it was a qualitative study of startups from Bangalore. And uh, Mike Wright was handling the paper, uh, and after a point when we were advanced in the re revision process, he said, well, we can see you're making a contribution to the international new venture literature, well, but what about your contribution to the broader management studies field? And so then I had to articulate a contribution to social capital theory more broadly and say that the context that I was looking at, internationalizing new ventures, allowed us to get insight into the dynamics of social capital development. So that's an extra burden I think you might experience in JMS, which um, you, you may or may not experience in an IB journal. Okay, what makes the paper appealing? Interesting findings, so show and tell. And uh, this is particularly true for qualitative papers, I think. Uh, there's a lot of expectation now that, that you don't describe what happened in passive terms. You more actively show what happened by with quotes and things like that. Uh, do not make unsubstantiated claims and interpret for the reader. The other is useful, expansive discussion. You know, answering the research question and saying how the findings extend existing knowledge and how they can be generalized to other settings. And so, the example I just gave you a moment ago, you do something on say international new ventures but you also say how it applies to the broader uh, 
field, like in my case, it was social capital theory. And of course, point out why uh, practitioners can benefit. No practitioner that I know reads the general management studies, um, but we need to be able to show what the practical implications are. So, you know, I think a lot of this is, is not unfamiliar to, to many of you, but, but worth uh, reiterating. Uh, so if there was one main message that I want to convey, it is about the importance of making a contribution. Now, one useful way to, to think about this, and I am indebted to Gideon Markman, one of my colleagues on the JMS team for, for this material, is about basically challenging what we already know, okay? So one way to think about contribution is, will your study change the truth or how we theorize or conduct research? Or is it asking expansive, fascinating questions? Will it open up a new domain, an old debate, bring clarity? So basically, this is what is the orientation that is needed. What is going to change in the way people think about this topic because of my study? What real problems are we addressing? What new lessons are we, could we potentially teach? And in a broader sense, what new wisdom? Okay, so this is hopefully of some value. I'm gonna go through a few examples that Gideon put together to say that, you know, you want to identify what people think in general about something and position what you have found as different. So uh, I have a couple of slides with examples. The first is this. So the dogma meaning, it's sort of like the, the, the received wisdom is, when firms acquire environmentally socially focused startups, the entrepreneurs are selling out, you know? So even when Ben and Jerry got acquired by Unilever, there were some Ben and Jerry fans who said, oh, you guys are selling out. Uh, but then hopefully people felt, oh, Unilever is serious about this. Well, here is an example of a paper which says, well, in fact, the smaller firms might be able to transmit their sustainability values to those larger companies that make the uh, acquisition. Now, of course, I would imagine that reviewers to this paper will want to be sure that these the claims are valid, that that is in fact what happened in the, uh, the uh, th that is in fact what the study revealed, whether it's based on qualitative or quantitative data. But if there is, is sufficient rigor in this and uh, people buy the argument, it's a very nice way to set up the contribution, right? And, and in fact, you can see that this is a decision made beforehand in a sense that uh, you're able to position the paper in terms of. Second example, so some people would say that only big governments can tackle big market failure problems. And an example of a paper uh, using effectuation theory uh, says, no, even private individuals can tackle such challenges. Now, this actually is the sort of topic that emerging market uh, context are very useful for, uh, because in many emerging markets, governments are not so effective at dealing with certain things. We have problems of institutional voids, and you will find that um, non-government actors, including in some cases market actors, entrepreneurs, firms, may be able to do something to address this. M my former colleague at Sebs, Rama Velamuri, uh, who is on the JMS Editorial Review Board, uh, he had done qualitative research in Zimbabwe and India about how entrepreneurs stand up to corruption. And he was able to show that they actually can uh, and identified some of the, the, the processes by which this happens and the mechanisms. Again, this would challenge a dogma. And so again, emerging markets can be very fruitful areas to look at that. Oh, sorry, I have a third example on this slide. Uh, Wealth creation is about making money. And uh, this is a study 
uh, by Lumpkin and back that says, no, you can also have civic wealth creation. Wealth encompasses not only financial gains, but also health, joy, justice, well-being, independence, etc. A fourth example that the received wisdom is entrepreneurship is about job creation, uh, economic growth, etc. But then this paper by uh, one of the JMS editors uh, with his co uh, with his uh, co author says no entrepreneurs can use cross sector partnerships, meaning partnerships involving the private sector, public sector, social sector, to better their adaptation to grand challenges. You know things like the sustainable uh, development goals and things like that. And then a, a fifth example is firms compete only with firms. And uh, the, the, this paper, in fact, Gideon's paper says, no, there can be non-market players too. And these kinds of examples um, also, I think, have a lot of potential in emerging market contexts where there are non-market actors that are clearly very important. Uh, and it's true both in China and India, but in slightly different ways. Uh, so in China, I think the state players are particularly important. In India, the, the state is, plays an important role. And over the past uh, several years, a lot of government initiatives have come into play to support industry and so on. Uh, but I also think in India, you have a lot of non-governmental organizations that are involved in a, in a way that's very different from China. So if you're a non-governmental organization in China, my colleagues in China know very well uh, the first thing you need to do is to find a government sponsor, which is so alien to the way in which non-governmental organizations think of themselves in other parts of the world. And in India, you know, NGOs play such an important role. So uh, these are sort of examples just to um, provoke your thinking. If you're thinking about how can I leverage being in an emerging market uh, and the observations we make here, to be able to publish in a journal like JMS and make a contribution to the wider management studies field, this is a good way to go about this. And actually, China and India are fertile um, settings to be able to do this. So uh, I hope this is helpful in terms of thinking about how to, to develop your, your idea. Oh, so a final one. Market entry is adversarial. Uh, and the answer is no, many startups penetrate markets that are dominated by large incumbents without necessarily intensifying rivalry. And, and this is an idea that's very close to my heart. Um, a lot of my own research, which sort of started with how new ventures go international has morphed into how do these new ventures engage with large corporations? Uh, because I found that some of the new ventures going international were in fact partnering with large multinationals to facilitate that process. Okay, let me pause now. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions that you want to raise now is, is an opportunity to do that. Uh, one thing, one way to do that will be to, in fact, the, the probably the most sensible thing to do is to type up any questions you have in the chat box, and uh, I will endeavor to address them. Ah, very good question. Does JMS take doctoral students as ad hoc uh, reviewers? Uh, in theory, there is nothing to prevent this from happening. Uh, and uh, I would say that we try to draw upon our pool of editorial board uh, on as much as we can. And the ad hoc reviewers tend to be people who are heavily cited in a paper and you think it only makes sense to uh, invite them to do so, but also people who have published in the journal, uh, especially ones who published recently, you know, because we think uh, uh, they would be minded to do so. So as a doctoral student, your odds of 
being invited to review a hire if you have published in JMS, which is not impossible, not easy. Um, but in some cases, I have in fact used ad hoc reviewers who are doctoral students. The way that has happened, if I'm honest, is that I will have approached a seasoned scholar in a particular area and they will have, might have declined, but said, so-and-so is an excellent doctoral student who is steeped in this literature, why don't you approach them? And so when there is that kind of a signal as well, I have used doctoral students and they've actually been very good, particularly in referring to the latest um, uh, literature. Okay. So is it possible to engage with JMS reviewers in the middle of the research process to take feedback? No, because you, you wouldn't know who the reviewers are, but what is certainly possible is while you're working on your revision, you can contact the action editor and say, we're struggling with this. Do you have uh, a, a point of view? And actually somebody did that um, recently and uh, asked whether I had a view on a dilemma they had. Uh, and uh, what I had to uh, admit though was there was no way I could guess how the reviewers would uh, look at this, but I gave them some advice just bas basically as a fellow, you know, as, as a fellow academic. So, so that sort of thing is, is possible, but obviously not, not with the reviewers directly. Is there any trend of research methods? How about operational research? Trend in terms of research methods, uh, I would say we are very open to a, a range of methods, but what I have received, a lot of it is pretty standard, large scale uh, panel data uh, type of research. Uh, so, I don't think the trend I'm seeing at JMS is any different from, from the normal trends. A lot of emphasis on large data scales with an emerging orientation to big data sets. Uh, that's what I'm seeing. Tiny bit of uh, interest in applying machine learning and things like that to really big data sets, but those I feel are weak signals. I think more will come in the future. Uh, some people are going much deeper into qualitative research and qualitative reviewers are pushing very hard uh, for greater rigor, which is as an author, <laughs> uh, uh, intimidating, but that's what's happening. People want lots and lots of um, interviews. So I would just say that the broad trend is greater sophistication. And I think that's common to many journals. Operations management per se, we don't tend to get uh, a lot of, uh, submissions to JMS, certainly I haven't, I haven't got, but what we've tried to do in the most recent round is to broaden our portfolio of action editors. And if we, if you did send something on operations, we would be able to, uh, to deal with that uh, as well. Uh, is it, okay, single case study approach, acceptable method in JMS, absolutely. Um, but the burden, on a single method, uh, a single case paper is is high, uh, but uh, you know most people who do the single uh, case method that I've seen tend to follow uh, either Denny Joya or Anne Langley, and in both cases it's about can you show some deep theoretical insights uh, into the process. So processual theory building with a single case, yes. Uh, we do have examples of that, and so, but if you, you know, there are now very clear expectations, and if you haven't seen it already, there's a paper in Strategic Organization, uh, which has the transcripts of, of an interview session at the AOM with Kathy Eisenhardt and Langley and Denny Joya, and uh, you can very clearly see now these three methods have evolved in different ways and are kind of institutionalized. So be be clear about who you're adopting. And what I try to do as an editor is not send such a paper to a Kathy Eisenhardt uh, disciple who only thinks in terms of eight to 12 cases, it has to be variance based. So, so yes, that, that, that's possible. Uh, can improvement in empirical rigor be considered as a research contribution, even if the same similar research question has been investigated earlier? My gut instinct is 
that is unlikely to be um, sufficient for publication in JMS. I can imagine one or two journals that focus more on empirical methods as a, as a substantive area of interest being uh, more interested in this. We would be interested in seeing a methodological contribution in addition to a theoretical contribution to management studies. But if there's no theoretical contribution to management studies, I'm afraid uh, it won't make the cut. Given the interpretive nature of qualitative studies, how does JMS evaluate the rigor, trustworthiness of qualitative work? Uh, it's a very good question. And again, I, I refer back to this article in, in Strategic Organization. I think now there's a little bit of consensus around what you need to have in qualitative research. And that's a big topic in and of itself. The main thing I would say is what is required is showing more than telling. So I think people, so if you do go down the Denny Gioia approach, people want to see the codes, some data structures to see how you went from your open codes to axial coding to the constructs that you um, uh, are using in your uh, theoretical output. Uh, Kathy Eisenhardt doesn't have time for that. She wants to see many more tables, especially for the variance theory part, which show comparisons between the different cases and illustrative quotes. Uh, for some reason, I'm also finding qualitative research uh, reviewers having more comfort when the number of interviews is on the high side, which to me doesn't fully make sense, but that's the norm now. Uh, I was talking to somebody about a paper for which I have 40 interviews, and they told me the, well, that data set is, sounds a bit thin. Uh, so there you go. But I think it's, it's showing more than telling, and a lot of it comes down to the figures and the tables that you provide where you match the constructs that you're talking about with illustrative quotes. I think that would be my simple answer for now. And uh, if, you, know, you can email me separately to continue that uh, discussion if you, if you wish. I'm thinking a lot about it as an author as well because I'm getting bruised badly on that score. So it's, it's not easy. Uh, but the paper that I'm closest to making an acceptance on, I am so pleased, A comes from an African context uh, so off the beaten track, and B is a qualitative study. And you know, with each round, I found that the authors have had to provide a little bit more data, one or two more tables, more connections between the qualitative evidence and the constructs, uh, and the connections between the constructs as well. Okay, let me stop there so I can, I can consider. Does JMS consider research from cross-functional domains? The answer is yes. Uh, but what needs to be clear is that there is a contribution to management studies. And I have desk rejected a couple of papers that have the appeal of being cross-functional, but it's just been written with a very different disciplinary audience in mind. And you know, from a practical point of view, it's very difficult for me to get reviewers from our pool to be able to deal with it. So, uh, and uh, it's not really going to fit very much in the JMS, um, the JMS conversation, the broad conversation. Uh, also, some of these papers I find don't reference any paper from JMS in the past, which again raises doubts in my mind. So the answer is yes but it has to be clear that it's relevant for a JMS audience and uh, makes a contribution to, to management studies. Does JMS prefer studies on firm level compared to ones on team level or individual level? You know, I think historically, uh, I, I actually haven't checked, but my instinct is we would have more firm level papers than individual level papers. But in the recent expansion of the JMS editorial team, care was taken to bring in people from OBHR backgrounds to signal very clearly that we are interested in research on teams and, and individuals. 
And one of and some of my colleagues in the OB department at SEBS recently had a paper accepted at JMS. Uh, so there is no inherent preference between the two. And if you have papers based on team level and individual level, we have uh, members of the editorial team who will look at it with interest. The other thing I would say is one of the very distinctive uh, areas of contribution that JMS has been very hospitable to in the strategy field is called strategy as practice. In fact, arguably it took off because of the JMS special issue in 2003. And actually that's a very good example of, of a stream of work challenging the status quo. And their main argument was too much work in strategy is done at the firm level and we don't look at what individuals do uh, in terms of strategy development and execution. And we have a lot of papers in strategist practice where the in-depth studies of individuals in terms of what they're doing and, and teams working, for example, in strategy workshops and things like that. So, so JMS is certainly open to that. Broad guidelines that interdisciplinary research should pay attention to, I think it's basically what I said, make sure that there is a contribution to management studies. And so when you're framing the contribution and you're thinking about what dogma you're challenging, make sure that it's something that management studies scholars care about and then justify your interdisciplinary or cross-functional approach uh, to be able to do this challenging and coming up with something that's interesting and insightful. Okay. Systematic literature review study find a, a, a place. So there is one of the four categories I mentioned now is review papers. Uh, and uh, so I think that would be uh, potentially possible. Joe, am I right in thinking that for the review papers that uh, typically there is a, a proposal that needs to be done? Um, um, no, for review papers, you could just submit. Okay, so it is a theoretical uh, possibility. What I will say is JMS does not have uh, review editions in the way that general management does. Uh, and I would also say that uh, it's a relatively rare occurrence in, in JMS to have uh, review papers. So we're not like the journal of management, for example, which I would say is a go-to journal for uh, review papers, but I'm sure uh, if uh, it's of a substantive uh, area of interest in terms of management studies, uh, and if you've seen that JMS has been hospitable to the area, then, then it's worth a try. Um, it's not as intuitive a target for me when I think about it as say the International Journal of Management Reviews. But of course, IJRM is not an FT journal, so I can understand why someone would consider JMS first. Okay, so it seems like I have actually managed to cover all of the, I managed to cover all of the questions and we still have about seven minutes. Uh, so what I'm going to do is actually ju then just uh, bring up my slides again and uh, just do two more slides that I was going to do afterwards uh, at the end, but uh, let me just get this in now. So this is just a final thought to leave you with in, in terms of the r and &R process. And I was going to say this to the people after the ideas workshop, you know, okay, so uh, if you submit this, hopefully you get an r and &R. what happens next? But let me share this with everybody. Uh, and I'm indebted to Brian Boyd, one of my uh, JMS, uh, fellow JMS associate editors for this. The big challenge is to get your r and &R, in a sense, because so many papers get desk rejected. Uh, so if you get, um, and two thirds of the papers that go out to review get rejected. So once you get your opportunity to revise and resubmit, the odds of acceptance go up dramatically. Uh, there's no guarantee, but um, you know, now you are playing, you know, 
it's it's um, definitely plausible that the paper could go through. Now, what I loved about this slide when that I saw from Brian is this represents my own experience as a author and editor a lot. You get one reviewer who loves your paper a lot uh, and has a lots of positive uh, suggestions. And then you have one reviewer who seems to hate everything about your paper. And then you have one reviewer who's, you know, a little bit all over the place and just gives you a range of positive and negative feedback. These kinds of uh, situations are very common and challenging, both for the editor to try and help make sense of and the author. One thing I would say is in these kinds of situations, pay careful attention to the editor's letter. What I try to do in these cases is to signal very clearly to the author what I consider to be the priority areas. Uh, and I'll be honest, we're also, I think, influenced to some extent by who the reviewers are. And so if there's a reviewer who's particularly influential in a particular field, uh, I think there's a little bit of uh, weightage given to that. I I'm experiencing that as an author right now. I have a paper under review at a journal which tries to draw upon the attention-based view. One reviewer loves it. One reviewer hates it. Unfortunately, I think the one who doesn't like it so much is one of the very influential scholars in attention-based view. And I can see very clearly the action editor emphasizing very much that reviewer's point. So, uh, but uh, what, what, what Brian is suggesting is actually these people play different roles in a sense, you know, so reviewer one is like the coach, reviewer two is the executioner, reviewer three is like the judge. But here's the thing. Why does this happen? It's because maybe in management we have a weak consensus on theory and methods. Different reviewers have different reviewer styles. Reviewers do not address every concern with your manuscript. They focus on what they see as key issues. And because they are also recruited to cover a range of things, right? One may be a substantive theory expert. The other may be more of a methods expert and ultimately disagreement among reviewers is, but this is a point, ultimately disagreement among reviewers is typically an indication that the contribution is still unclear. And so I end with, uh, again, what I see as the main theme, and I, I fully concur with um, what Brian says here, the best preparation for a revise and resubmit is done before the submission in terms of thinking about your contribution. Okay, and so everything we've said in uh, today about thinking about what dogma you're going to challenge and how what you're coming up with is somehow different or novel uh, is, um, is going to be uh, useful. Okay, so uh, we are done with about, uh, about a couple of minutes to spare and uh, the, the person who just about asked about JMS essays, uh, please refer to the response that Joe has kindly uh, posted. And there's a, a specific person on the team who deals with this, Mark Healy, uh, and uh, you're welcome to, to reach out 